Tonight on Love and Respect, part two of my conversation with Tyler Perry. One thing my father gave to me is the man had the most stupid work ethic I've ever seen in my life. Rain, sleet, snows, hurricanes, lightning, he was going. Even though we don't speak, he gets a check every month. I, he, I bought wow. a house and he's taken care of because he, I'm giving him exactly what he gave me. Financially, we were never hungry and the lights were never off, right? So I give him that. Coming from that place, watching his work ethic, I definitely have that because I don't know what kind of man I would have been had I seen a man that didn't work. More with Tyler Perry coming up right now. Your movies present a lot of times problems that we've all faced. Mm -hmm. and, and do you use your art um, as a form of example or as a form of therapy? For poor and working class people may not get to a therapist, but after you watch a Tyler Perry movie and you get to the end, you see Cicely Tyson at the end of it, you see the whole family yeah. coming together, you see Maya Angelou, you start to say, you know what, we, we should have a family reunion. We've been separated as a family too long. We need to get there. Yeah, that's a true story that's happened to me and my sister's like, mm -hmm. we need to get the family together. Mm -hmm. So do you do that? Purposes. Obviously, you do it purposefully, but do you understand the healing properties that your movies have? You know, in the beginning, for sure, like the first 10 movies, I think, were about my mother subconsciously, just yeah. about what she had went through and wanting black women to know you're worthy, you don't have to deal with it, you don't have to put up with it, it's okay. And, and yeah, I, I intentionally wanted it to be that first because especially the stage plays, man, for me, the, the only reason to sit there to do, to do as well as I've done and to go out on tour is financially it wasn't a, a win, big win. You know, what it was, was I get to sit with the people and talk. And it's, this, it's those last 10, 15 minutes of the play that are the, my favorite when Medea can sit there and talk about anything mm -hmm. and the audience is pen quiet because that's the therapy moment for me. Yes. That's the moment where I'm planting the seeds. That's the moment where I see the shift change, man. Because I would watch people come in, they, couples be apart from each other like this and coming with attitudes, not holding hands. Guys, sometimes from the dressing room, I look out at them walking to their cars yeah. when they're coming in or walking when they're leaving. Yeah. And the difference is amazing. Just the laughter and the joy that I'm hearing outside the window. That's what it's all about. That's me and Shining when we arguing about being late. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then she creep to the side and have a prayer with me before yeah. we do this. Yeah. And then we're not arguing no more. And yeah. I leave just just thankful I have a wife. Yep. Even if she take a little longer sometimes. That's right. Don't tell <laughs> I said I don't want no beef. No, it won't be on TV. You, <laughs> you are from a city of, in rap we call it hustlers, and mm. you know, and, and and in other places they call them entrepreneurs, they call them grinders, but. People who I've seen come from your city, as big as Master P and Baby and Slim, as modestly big, but still very big, as people like my personal friends, Currency and Big Frida. Mm. You guys have an amazing work ethic and have made this city better, but that work ethic. Could you talk about developing that work ethic? Coming from New Orleans, you had to you had to hustle to survive, right? You had to. If you're gonna if you're gonna make it there, you had to. So I think that mentality of boss, that mentality of leader, that mentality of, of getting it done, making it happen, truly comes from from the very uh, culture of the city, right? Yeah. It's not always lazy, le bon ton relay, you know, let the good times roll. It is work and get it done. Yeah. And one thing my father gave to me is the man had the most stupid work ethic I've ever seen in my life. Rain, sleet, hurricanes, lightning, he was going. A sun up to sundown. We, and, and what I can say about him is, and this I give him, even though we don't speak, he gets a check every month. I, he, I bought wow. a house and he's taken care of because he, I'm giving him exactly what he gave me. Wow. Financially, we were never hungry yeah. and the lights were never off, right? Yeah. So I give him that. And and I feel good about that because no matter what he did, he still made sure I had food on the yeah. table, right? So coming from that place, watching his work ethic, I definitely have that because I don't know what kind of man I would have been had I seen a man that didn't work, that yeah. was laying home on the couch all the time, you yeah. know? So. Yeah. It, it's amazing that you can understand the pathology and forgive. It's amazing that you can take the work ethic and the good from. It's amazing that you can keep the family name and make sure that lineage says you are truly a biblical like character. And and, and I just I, I refuse to let don't, this show go on without Don't catch you know, me on Friday night. I, I, hey, hey, late, hey, late, hey, late. Saul Saul before he was Paul. <laughs> That's the truth. Right. <laughs> right. Did a That's lot right. of sin and killed a lot of Christians <laughs> That's right. before he helped save the world. But I, I just have to acknowledge that because so many times in our acknowledgement and praise of who, you know, I feel God is a black woman. Mm. Um, but what comes <laughs> through a black woman is just as holy. Black men deserve that. Yeah. We deserve an example like you. And even in not talking and still honoring your father 
um, like the scripture says, honor thy father and mother. Yeah. Lots of ways to honor. That's a very honorable thing. So thank just you. thank you for saying that because I know a lot of brothers are out there riddled with guilt because yeah. they walked away from their responsibilities and didn't do what they did in keeping food in the refrigerator and, and a roof over one's head. And you are, are, are an example of what a black man can be um, fighting through the odds, forgiving others, forgiving oneself and pushing. You, um, it, thank you. You make this economy better. You and the former mayor, Kasim Reed, brokered the deal, correct, to be here. Yes. Um, you understand that being in Atlanta, adding to this comedy, makes for a stronger economy. What brought you to that conclusion? Was it just common sense, like the old folks say? It's just common sense. Mm -hmm. Was it a dare with you and Kasim to say, we're going to dare to do something different, we're going to try? And what, um, what could other people learn from the move you made? Listen, I was out. I called Kasim to say, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm, I'm moving to Douglasville. I bought some property out there. I was going to build a stage. You was going to leave the city, man? I was going to leave the city. I, I, I wanted, because, only the only reason, because I wanted land, a lot of space. Yes. And I couldn't find land in the city. He said, well, have you thought of Fort McPherson? I had never heard of this place. So he's yeah. like, just come, take a look. I drove around, and I was like, okay, I get it. This is bigger than me. I got to take this, take yeah. this on. So, so that's how that's how that happened. But in the in the understanding of all of it, man, what I was really simply just trying to do, and what I tell everybody is, if you're starting a business or working for someone else, ownership will dictate everything. Mm -hmm. What, what decision you make, how you make it. So my main focus was ownership. And I tell you, if ownership is the root of the tree, everything else with the, the, with the trunk and the branches and all the other stuff and the leaves that change and fall, it all came from that. So, so what I'm experiencing is, is living from the decisions of making sure that I owned every play, every movie, every, everything, every, every television show, so that I could be in a position where I could help change an economy. So that was, that was my purpose here, it's just ownership. So it all intersects. You look at Maynard, well, I go to White Mayor first. William Hartsfield gave Delta 50-year contract, so Delta could be here, becomes a hub. Mm -hmm. First black mayor says 29% of contracting and business with the city has to be black. Yeah. He starts to build out a black enclave on the west side as early as 1948. All that leads to an opportunity for a owner to call a mayor, mm -hmm. both black men, mm -hmm. both of them around the same age, and say, hey, man, I'm going to leave and go to Douglasville because they got said, a lot of land. He said, no, 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 I can't let you do that. I let the Braves go, but I ain't let Tyler This was around that same time. Okay. <laughs> he, okay. He said, yeah, I was like, Braves let's left. You know, this might be the time to just make that call to see what happens. He said, no, 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 we're not letting that happen. So, and yeah. keeps you in the city yeah. by, have, by, by making sure that you get Fort Mac. Mm -hmm. And for people who don't understand, when you hear Outkast rap about East Point College Park, this is what they're rapping about. Mm -hmm. this, is, mm -hmm. this, this is literally in the city. So children get to drive by on a highway named for Arthur Lankford, who was a former state representative, mm -hmm. a black man. Mm -hmm. And you get off that highway on the Tyler Perry Studios as an exit, and then you get to come here. That's this something. is the type of inspiration that my imagination used to dream about, reading Ebony and reading Jet. How did reading Ebony and Jet affect you in terms of your dreams, and how did you overcome doubts? Because with pain, with anguish, and with failure yeah. comes doubt. Yeah. How did you become walking black history and overcoming those doubts. Walking black history, okay. That's what you are. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. And American Se history. Thank you. Se seven years of, of the show failing. Every year I put it up, it wouldn't work. Every year I put it up, it wouldn't work. Until I got to here to Atlanta, went to the 14th Street Playhouse, then went to the Fox, and went to the Tabernacle, and it all started to work, right? Really? Oh, yeah. That was, yeah, man. I came here, was going to do, uh, at the 14th Street Playhouse, I had saved all my money, rented it, Thought people would show up. I was downstairs in the basement. It's the SCAD uh, mm -hmm. playhouse now, but down in the basement, 200 seated, 30 people showed up, lost everything I had. Then went to um, every year a promoter, one of these janky pro twisted promoters, be like, yeah, man, I, I got that's some money. I'm going to put you up over here. You know, so I do the show with them. Didn't make any money once a year. And, and uh, then we got a chance to do the House of Blues. But at that time, at that time, at that time I was done. I was completely done. I wasn't going to go through it anymore. I wasn't going to suffer anymore. I'd had it. And I did that one last show. That show sold out. It was March in 1998, freezing, and there were people around the corner trying to get in the place. Wow. And then I went to the Fox, sold out 4,500 seats there. So, but all of you talk about fairies, all of those moments leading up to it were making the choice of do I keep this job 
that's paying me, like my mother said, 300 something dollars a week and getting some benefits? Or do I leave to go pursue my dream? So every time I left, I felt like, am I making the right decision? Mm -hmm. What a moment if this doesn't work. And it, they never worked. Mm -hmm. I thought I was failing every time until I realized that every one of those moments was building me for, for where I am now. Mm -hmm. So they were all character building. They were all preparing me to be able to run this. You know, I'm so glad I didn't get it all at once. I'm glad I struggled and went back and forth and had to figure things out because, man, I'd probably be a mess right now. You had to learn to be frugal. Yeah. Had to learn to be responsible. Smart. Um, taxes. Yeah, absolutely. Things that black, black folks, we did taxes. Nope. I'm like, wait a minute, you mean I can't go to H&R Block this year and I made $100 million? No, you cannot go to H&R Block. Block. Yeah. This not this year. <laughs> not this year, yeah. You, you, um, you have overcome your doubts beautifully and you have inspired others. Um, people that have even worked in your trajectory now are still around the industry helping other people. It's amazing to me the spirit of giving that you have. At your 2021 um, Gene Herschel acceptance speech, you said this, stand in the middle, meet people at their humanity, refuse to hate. Yeah. I want to say that again. Yeah. Stand in the middle. Yeah. It means you're not extreme on each side. Yep. Meet people at their humanity. So even if I disagree with you, I'm going to find the place you're human at. Right. And we're going to have a conversation or we're going to do some building there. And refuse to hate. Right. That's one I'm still working on. I got a couple people I hate. I'm trying, yeah, I'm trying to know, man. All right. Refuse to hate. What does the term love and respect mean to you? Yeah, basically all of those things that you said because when you love someone you will do all of those things you will you may not be, understand you may not agree you may but you can meet in the middle to have conversation and that's also the respecting of people right respecting the very humanity that we all share yeah. to see someone and be able to put yourself in their shoes that's love and respect absolutely whoever they are be it uh, the Afghans who are trying to find homes that get out of the country at one point or are yeah. Mexican or Haitian immigrants trying to get in. Mm -hmm. but, but just take a moment and put yourself in their shoes. Does, does that mean that every rule goes out of the window? No. But what it does mean is that you have the capacity and the empathy to be a, a human enough to be able to understand, to show them the love and the respect they deserve. Absolutely. Yeah. That's amazing. That's, yeah. That, that definitely is one I am. Um, I've told this story before and I'll tell it a lot and I'll say it again. My grandmother was a sharecropper young, um, worked for a white family that was poor themselves, not very nice to the boys or girls. Found a letter years later of that woman thanking my grandmother for helping her when the kids had essentially moved north and abandoned her. Flipped out on all my crazy radical, you know you read one radical book as a kid, you mm. black empowerment, yep. why would you help those yep. white folks? Yep. She literally looks at me and says, they didn't know any better. Yeah. And I didn't understand how deep of a comment that was, because mm -hmm. you, the pathology, and you know what you're taught, right? You know, and those weren't Negro children. Those, were, right? yeah. Those weren't children. Those were labor. Yeah. And that has informed me to this day how to be empathetic to people. So my Madea, you know, thank, thankfully taught me that young, and more people learning that we create more Tyler Perry's. That's an absolutely amazing. Um, answer to why and what love and respect mean to you. I appreciate it. The Tyler Perry Foundation is love and respect on steroids. I've heard stories of Mr. Perry doing times of disaster, calling the local Walmarts or grocery stores. How many people are in there now? We got about 300 folks in here. This is Mr. Tyler Perry. Everybody's stuff is on me. You have found creative and innovative ways to help people in times of need where other people were trying to figure it out, you were putting together a 30 page handbook. When everybody was trying to figure out how to get trucks there, you were calling buying out stores. Is that informed by being poor and on your ass yourself? And what makes you continue to do that work when other people are just turning to a government saying, why aren't you helping? Like, Well, absolutely. When we talk about being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, well, I've been there. There was a woman, I wish to God I could find her. Probably every, a bunch of women are going to say it was me at this point. <laughs> but I remember being in Winn-Dixie and there was something called a Big 60. It was 60 cookies. And they were like 79, 80 cents, if I, if I recall. Mm -hmm. And that was my meal for the week. 
and I didn't have, I knew I had changed and I knew I didn't have enough. And I'm standing there in the line, there's a line of people, it's on Buford Highway, line of people behind me, and I'm trying to find the money. And she uh, says, go ahead, baby, I'll get it. And she just had the most compassion in her eyes, I could barely look at her. That, those kind of moments, they, they always sit with me when I, when I see people struggling and suffering. You know, when I go into my kitchen and I, I open the drawer and I take out a fork, man, that's a huge moment for me because as a kid, when I would open that drawer, the rats would run up my arm. So I clearly, understand and have never forgotten what that feels like mm -hmm. and I probably uh, to, to say this which may not sound so great but I probably I probably at this level of success because of where I came from I was running so damn hard to get away from it mm -hmm. so when I see somebody in need somebody in Walmart or somebody struggling somebody kids got kids stuff for layaway or, you know at these Walmarts and things okay what can I do here in these moments like Thanksgiving around in during the pandemic we we fed 5,000 people man the the whole cars were lined up forever. Yeah. And I, I got a call saying, you should come take a drive. I drove around, man. I, every street was blocked. And I was just like, the need is so great. I can't do it alone, but what, this is what I can do. Yeah. And if everybody would just do what they can do, yeah. it, it, you know, if it's, even if it's one slice of bread, it's enough. Yeah. Who's your counsel? Who does Tyler get to lean on in juggling these things? Who's the person that, or who are the people? Yeah. That, I call T.D. Jakes a lot spiritually for spiritual advice and, and he gives me a lot that I need to just, you know, understand life, God, faith, moving on, moving through this. Yeah. And Oprah, man, Oprah is like for me, I say, hey, you know, this and this and this is going on. She's like, oh, I went through that in 83. Here's what you do, that, that, this and this and this, you know? So so having people like that that I can reach out to who's, who's who are older and who walked ahead of me, yeah. that is really, really helpful. And, you know, Cecily Tyson, who you know, died in January God was, was a um, huge mentor to me, somebody I loved dearly, and just to have that level of wisdom, yeah. crazy. And I sat with her and Sidney Poitier and Bernie Casey at my house many years ago and just listened. There's a famous poem by one of the men, again, who I consider a hero, but was not kind mm -hmm. and um, was not encouraging of Zora. And it's, what happens to a dream deferred by mm -hmm. Langston Hughes? Mm -hmm. His axes are shrivel up like raisins, mm. fade away. But you are a dream confirmed. Mm. And I'd like to ask you, um, what dreams remain after this confirmation? What, what dreams still push Mr. Perry? Like you are a dream confirmed. You're not a dream deferred. Yeah. You're not a sad story. You're not an almost could have. You're not an unsung. You are a dominator. Mm. You are a leader. You are a visionary. What happens to your dream confirmed next? Mm. That, wow, dream confirmed. That's that's a whole. Come on, give I, it to me. Now. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's that's, 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 that's it, are, man. Man. That was strong. That was strong. Yeah, you need to go ahead and write that. My man, write that whole thing. Answer him. Yeah. yeah. For for me, looking at all of this, I I um, at this point right now, it's, everything is about my son. Yes. Whatever he wants to do, you know, if he wants to come and be in the business, I just want him to be an incredible man. Right. That's my dream now. Mm -hmm. Just be an incredible man because I feel like I've done almost everything that I'm supposed to do. I know there's still a lot more yeah. levels to, to the game for me, but I've done almost everything I, I was supposed to do. So now it's very much about, okay, who's next? Because I'm constantly looking. I think it was Cicely Tyson in the movie going, are you the one? Are you the one? Because mm -hmm. she was looking through all these black children trying to find out who's the next one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who, who, I'm looking for those kids yeah. who, are, who are special and different and unique and have been ostracized and criticized and gone through some hell and really wanted yeah. to come up and say, hey, okay, you're, you, we, we have this kinship. Here we are, let me show you what I've learned. Yeah. Let's take this and run. Because man, I called all of these kids, man, in their 30s, this one who's nominated for this and this one who's just did this one, this one, and I'm like, hey, come sit down, let's talk. Don't, don't even get phone calls back. I kid you not. And Jay-Z and I were talking about this. He said, man, I get it. And I was like, what is it? He said, I don't know if they think we want something from them. Yeah. All we're trying to do is pass on the knowledge yeah. so that you will not end up being in a situation where you're waiting for somebody to give you a job when you're 45 and 50 and the career's yeah. not so hot. Yeah. So my whole thing right now is passing it on. I want to thank you for the pride that black people get. I want to thank you for the economic um, boom that you brought to this city for not just black people. I'd like to thank you for working with Kasim and making sure that a former Confederate fort is now a place, because Confederacy was built upon the predication of these people are beasts and deserve to work for us. Yeah. Owning this fort is significant in a way that shouting at flags is not. Yep. 
providing jobs for people who are often descendants of the Confederacy and descendants of, sla descendants of slavery is a noble and just thing to do. I think you're an amazing man. I look forward to growing a friendship and a mentorship relationship with you, I hope. And I really appreciate you for coming on Love and Respect today. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Absolutely, brother. Absolutely. Anything for you, man. Absolutely. I appreciate Love it. Love and respect. Thank you so Bless much. You. Absolutely.